So welcome everybody to this lecture on the new revised KDGO clinical practice guidelines for glomerular diseases. Um, the, these guidelines have originated from a conference. Um, uh, wait, wait, we have to start over. Because this conference will now be recorded. So welcome everybody to this lecture on the revised KDGO clinical practice guidelines on glomerular diseases. Um, this whole topic evolved um, after a conference that we held in Singapore some three years ago in which, uh, as you can see, a large number of experts gathered and the main purpose of this uh, KDGO controversies conference was to ask ourselves which of the 2012 guidelines need an update. As you can see on the next slide, um, a lot of the, uh, of the guidelines needed an update. Everything that has a green tick mark needs an update and we were kind of surprised to see how few uh, were still okay and could be taken over to a revision. But keep in mind that the 2012 guidelines were actually based on the knowledge prior to 2010. So really 10 years have elapsed and the good news is we had a lot of new studies. Now, KDGO, as you all know, is based on the grade system. Uh, so you will find several uh, kinds of uh, levels. Grade one, uh, level one is we recommend. Level two, the much weaker level is we suggest. And then it's 1A, if there is high evidence, we are confident that the true effect is close to what we uh, estimate as opposed to D, where the uh, estimate of effect is very uncertain and may be far from the truth. The new feature of the KDGO guidelines is practice points. Um, and you will find them throughout the revised uh, guidelines when they come to public review or ultimately to publication. And this is something where we felt we need to provide guidance uh, when either this seems plausible, but there will never be clinical trials to prove it, or when we wanted to emphasize something that we feel is important, even though formally this is not evidence-based. Um, here, here's a good example of this. Uh, kidney biopsy is gold standard. Uh, that's trivial, but it's important to stress and uh, practice point 112, evaluation of kidney tissue should meet standards of bio biopsy adequacy, seems trivial, but there will never be a randomized trial looking at how much kidney tissue do you need to do a diagnosis, or at least it seems unlikely. So um, having said that, let's go into detail. Oh, here's one more feature that I forgot. Um, we will also have the guidelines appear on the Magic App tool ultimately. And the important feature of that will be that Magic App allows us ultimately to continuously update the guidelines so that hopefully in the future, we will never have a situation again where our written guidelines are 10 years old and really outdated. So, Having said that, this is what you will uh, hear about. Uh, the guideline is huge. It's probably one of the largest, if not the largest, uh, that KDGO has ever produced. And even just the executive summary is a mere 60 pages long and fairly extensive. So um, the whole guideline is several hundred pages and will be out for public review. It says uh, in the top corner that it's April. More likely it will be May or June. But following that, we will revise the guideline and hopefully it should be formally published in autumn of this year. So 
In the lecture that will follow, I will focus on the few most important diseases uh, that is uh, IgA nephropathy, membranous, minimal change, and FSGS, anchor vasculitis, and lupus. Now, let's start with IgA nephropathy. Um, IgA nephropathy, the first practice point is on prognosis, uh, and it says that considerations for the prognostication of primary IgA involve clinical and histological uh, data at the time of biopsy, and that you should be using at the time of biopsy the international IgN prediction tool, which is available on a website called uh, QXMD. Now, the important thing is that this tool cannot be used to determine the likely impact of any treatment, and there are no validated prognostic serum or urine biomarkers on for IgA uh, nephropathy outside of proteinuria. Now, this is the biopsy tool, which I would encourage you to use, keeping in mind that it's only validated for the time point of the kidney biopsy. You cannot use it at right now at any time that is later than the kidney biopsy. Practice point number 231, um, all patients for IgA with IgA nephropathy should have their uh, supportive care optimized. They should have a cardiovascular risk assessment and uh, appropriate interventions. And they should be given lifestyle advice, in particular on sodium, uh, very particularly on smoking, tenfold increased risk if you smoke for going on to dialysis, weight control, and exercise as appropriate. Now, these are the recommendations which have been published many times, uh, so I won't go into detail, but they, of course, involve blood pressure control, up titration of a RAS blocker, protein intake, dietary advice, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Here comes the first recommendation, and it's a 1B recommendation, so good level of evidence. We recommend that all patients with proteinuria above 0.5 grams per 24 hours, irrespective of whether they have hypertension, and this is important to stress, are treated with a RAS blocker. 2.3.3 will say that we suggest that all patients who remain at high risk despite this maximum supportive care, are considered for a six-month course of corticosteroid. And here's where the new guidelines become much more cautious uh, and really stress the important risk of treatment emergent toxicity based on several trials where uh, significant toxicity has been observed with corticosteroid therapy and IgA nephropathy. Oh, here's... Uh, a list of caveats where we suggest you use extreme caution uh, or avoid corticosteroids entirely if your GFR is below 30, if you're diabetic, if you're grossly overweight, if you have latent infection. We had several casualties in the testing trial from infections in China. If there's secondary IgA nephropathy, if there's ulcer disease or psychiatric disease. Um, this is stressed even more given the outcome, the very long-term outcome data of our own STOP IGA trial. Um, what you can see here is that we were able to capture 92% of our original study population after a median of 7.4 years. So of the 162 patients who underwent randomization, we were able to find 70 who had been assigned to the supportive care arm only, and 74 who had been assigned to the uh, immunosuppression arm. So this is really the very long-term outcome uh, now. And here's the key slide. The long-term endpoint was no different at all in the patients who received immunosuppression, the red line, or the patients assigned to supportive care. And note two important features. First of all, the probability 
of event-free survival was just 30% after the uh, seven-year follow-up on average. And note that the long-term endpoint has changed to death and stage kidney disease or a GFR loss above 40. So a very hard endpoint, uh, unlike the softer endpoint that we had in the original trial. So the original concern that the STOP IGA trial may have been too short or may have used soft endpoints is no, not valid. And the other concern that we have studied a low risk population, certainly given this high event rate, is not valid anymore. So this even more questions the value of uh, immunosuppression. The good news with IgA nephropathy is that we have a large number of clinical trials ongoing, both in phase two and phase three in IgA, but also in FSGS, which I will come to in a minute. And look at this. There's lots of new trials with completely new approaches ongoing, which really should make our life much easier um, and should hopefully lead to better therapy in the future. Let's switch to membranous. Uh, in membranous nephropathy, the guidelines will first start with a practice point. Uh, use clinical and lab criteria to assess the risk of progressive loss of kidney function. So as in IgA nephropathy, try to identify those patients who are at risk for losing kidney function. This is a table that we came up with where we group the patients into low risk. If you have normal GFR and proteinuria uh, below 3.5 grams per day or a normal albumin, or very high risk where you have life-threatening uh, nephrotic syndrome, your kidney function declines uh, very quickly, or you have a high level of low molecular weight proteinuria, which again indicates a high risk. So if you stratify these patients and target those who have a risk factor for progression, we then recommend using rituximab or cyclophosphamide and steroids for six months, or tacrolimus uh, with a choice of treatment depending on the risk estimate. Um, and clearly the guidelines will be more specific which drug we would uh, recommend for whom. So. Here you have a wait and see policy in the low risk group. In moderate risk, it seems best to either wait and see, use rituximab or a calcineurin inhibitor. And the other extreme would be to use cyclophosphamide in the very high risk group, because this is the only approach with a documented long-term benefit for in terms of kidney function uh, preservative. This is a landmark study published last year, the uh, famous MENTOR study, which compared rituximab or cyclosporin in membranous nephropathy. And the rituximab was given as one gram on day one and day 14. It's important to keep the regimen in mind. So here's the likelihood of partial or full remission at 24 months for the group receiving rituximab or cyclosporin, and you can clearly see that the two treatments did not differ for the first one year. And then there's a rapid increase of uh, treatment failure in the cyclosporin arm. However, you have to keep in mind that at one arm, there was the end of treatment. So in a way, the comparison is a little unfair because cyclosporin will have disappeared two days after you stop treatment, whereas the rituximab effect was clearly a much longer lasting effect. So in this second half, it's a little bit a comparison of apples and oranges. And this was a common critique uh, of the mentor trial. Practice point uh, number three, Longitudinal monitoring of phospholipase A2 receptor antibody levels is important to evaluate treatment response. Um, and again, the practice guideline and the whole guideline has changed a lot uh, compared to the old one because phospholipase A2 hadn't been identified 10 years ago. Uh, 
So uh, a lot of therapeutic decisions is now based on the behavior of the titers of the antibodies or the levels of the antibodies. If they are absent, you can stop pretty quickly. If they increase, you may have somebody with uh, resistant disease and you have to consider special treatment. Minimal change nephropathy and focal segmental glomerulosclerosis. Uh, the first recommendation, 1C level is, we recommend high dose oral corticosteroids for initial therapy of minimal change disease in adults. I won't go into the pediatric guidelines here. And uh, usually this would be corticosteroids unless there are contraindications, in which case you can pick your choice from any of these three approaches. Recommendation 5.3.1, we suggest uh, cyclophosphamide, rituximab, calcineurin inhibitors or mycophenolic acid analogs. If there's frequently relapsing or even corticosteroid dependent minimal change as compared to prednisone alone alone. Now, there's increasing evidence that in particular calcineurin inhibitors rep uh, represent a uh, viable alternative to high dose steroids. This is one of the studies published very recently from the UK where adult patients with minimal change placed on tacrolimus as opposed to prednisolone did almost as good uh, with achieving complete remission at week eight uh, in both of these study arms. Tapering was then done after remission and again the achievement of complete remission wasn't different as was the relapse rate. Frustratingly, yes, there's a high relapse rate over the next one and a half years. Uh, but if you have the choice between high dose prednisolone or tacrolimus, many of us would probably turn to tacrolimus. The adverse event rate was comparable. Now, FSGS in adults, it depends again on the clinical presentation. If there's nephrotic syndrome uh, with high-grade proteinuria and hypoalbuminuria, this is likely primary FSGS and it will likely require immunosuppression. If there's no nephrotic syndrome, undervaluate, uh, evaluate for an underlying cause exclude secondary forms, this is very important, obesity is not an uncommon cause, and exclude genetic forms, uh, also if there is uh, hypoalbuminuria. Consider genetic screening, uh, in particular in the young population. In most adults, it's probably not cost effective uh, at this point in time. Do not start immunosuppression, use supportive therapy, and monitor proteinuria. Now, recommendation uh, 6.2.2.1 is if you consider immunosuppression, it would be high dose corticosteroids be first line with a 1D level of recommendation. Anchor vasculitis. Here's a complex, uh, but once you go through it, uh, quite plausible approach to anchor vasculitis. You have a diagnosis. Your induction of remission would usually involve cyclophosphamide or, uh, or rituximab and glucocorticosteroids. You have disease control on remission. You switch to maintenance. This could be azathioprine or methotrexate uh, and tapering of glucocorticoids. Or you consider uh, rituximab or you taper then to monotherapy, or you stop the rituximab and see what happens if you're off drug. If there's no organ threatening involvement, you can consider methotrexate uh, or MMF. Methotrexate, of course, being unusual in most kidney patients because of the uh, contraindication to methotrexate if you have advanced kidney failure. And Usually it will be used if you have non-renal involvement. The other important situation would be if there's life-threatening uh, anchor vasculitis, in which case you could consider 
uh, plasma freezes. Now, plasma freezes, um, oh, sorry, uh, we recommend that corticosteroids in combination with cyclophosphamide or rituximab be used as first line treatment. This is a strong recommendation to induce remission. And in terms of maintenance, we would, uh, again, as I said, recommend maintenance with rituximab or azathioprine and low dose corticosteroids. Again, a fairly strong recommendation. Plasmapheresis in very severe anchor vasculitis was just tested in 704 patients. Again, a landmark trial finally published. 18% had pulmonary hemorrhage, 9% severe. Mean uh, median creatinine was high, 20% were dialysis patients, and these patients were then randomized to a fairly complex scheme where either steroids were given full dose or half dose, and the other decision was to give plasma exchange or no plasma exchange. The take home of that study was that no plasma exchange was just as good as plasma exchange and 50% steroid uh, was just as good as full dose corticosteroids in terms of death or preventing end stage kidney failure. And that in itself is an important uh, message because the feeling is that most of the toxicity is associated with high dose corticosteroids. Here's a uh, slide summarizing the uh, observed effects and particularly focusing on adverse events, where the one big difference came out with reduced dose versus standard dose glucocorticosteroids, where there were 30% fewer serious infections at one year in the low dose corticosteroid group. Here's the dosing scheme of the reduced dose corticosteroid scheme. And again, this is something important to consider where you only treat with high doses for one week and then half by 50% and fairly quickly reduce so that after three months, you had a relatively low dose already. And this of course um, would hopefully be just as effective as current therapy, but uh, you have 30% fewer adverse events. And finally, lupus nephritis. Recommendation 10.2.11 is that we recommend that all patients with lupus nephritis should be treated with hydroxychloroquine or an equivalent uh, antimalarial unless there are contraindications, which in reality, there are very few. This is what you should do in class one and class two lupus nephritis. If there's low level of proteinuria, um, your approach should be guided by extra renal manifestations. If there is nephrotic syndrome, evaluate for lupus podocytopathy by electron microscopy, in which case these should receive treatment as minimal change disease. And mostly this would then call for low dose glucocorticosteroids or other immunosuppression if you have lupus nephritis class three or four, the uh, new guidelines will recommend that if there's active class three or four lupus nephritis, you should treat these patients with corticosteroids plus low dose IV cyclophosphamide or mycophenolic acid, 1B recommendation. So we're fairly confident here. And that after completion of the initial therapy, these patients should be placed on mycophenolic uh, acid for maintenance. Again, a fairly confident recommendation. And finally, class five, where we have relatively little uh, information. Uh, these patients, if they have low level proteinuria, should be monitored and receive supportive care and immunosuppression should be guided by extra renal manifestations. And of course, Again, they should be on hydroxychloroquine. If they are nephrotic, they should have combined immunosuppression with glucocorticosteroids and one other agent, which is really up to the patient and up to you which one you pick. So this in a nutshell 
was what you will see in the executive summary, which is 60 pages, as I said. Uh, and if you have a lot of time, uh, please read the 400 or so uh, pages of the total guidelines. They will be up for public review very soon. So you're all encouraged to comment on these guidelines so that hopefully then we can uh, publish a consented guideline very soon and later this year. Thank you very much for listening to this lecture. This conference will now be recorded. So welcome to this special lecture, uh, Editor's Choice of Best Papers of Kidney International published over the many years. And I'm very happy to present these highlights, highlights and landmark papers uh, from over 60 years uh, in the past that Kidney International and the ISN has existed. So the first paper which in the glomerular field we have picked as a landmark paper is by Curtis Wilson and Frank Dixon from at that time La Jolla in California where they had a clinical series of patients with anti-glomerular basement membrane antibody induced glomerular nephritis. And what they have published is a case series of patients with and without nephrotic, uh, with and without good pasture syndrome. And they recognize that both varieties can exist. There can be pure uh, kidney involvement uh, without good pasture syndrome, and there can be kidney and lung involvement, the pulmorenal syndrome. And they suggested uh, at that time, and I, I think that was very visionary, to eventually replace the term good pasture syndrome by the more exact and correct uh, term anti-basement membrane antibody induced glomerular nephritis and pulmonary hemorrhage. And most of us, I believe, are using this term nowadays. Paper number two is only two years later. It's by famous Jean Berger, who discovered in the late 60s IgA nephropathy. He was the first to recognize that IgA staining, which at that time had been considered kind of an odd bystander phenomenon. He described uh, first that this is an independent uh, disease. And in 1975, he was the first to recognize that these deposits recur after kidney transplantation. And we now know that in the majority of patients with IgA nephropathy who receive a kidney transplant, these uh, deposits will recur. Here's an original photograph. This is prior to uh, kidney transplantation. And um, the, uh, the deposits of IgA are extensive. Six months after kidney transplantation, they're back again, and you can then see how the deposits increase in number and size. And they argue that uh, recurrence uh, after transplantation is one more argument in favor of a real disease. The next one is dated 1982 uh, in Australia, in Melbourne. Kenneth Fairley and Douglas Birch described hematuria and assessing hematuria and looking at the red blood cells as a simple method for identifying glomerular disease and glomerular bleeding. And they were among the first to recognize what we now know as Mickey Mouse erythrocytes or acanthocytes, more correctly. And they found that this really characterizes many patients with glomerular bleeding. Uh, oops, sorry. Many of them with uh, proliferative glomerular diseases. And here's the most important sentence. At present, many patients with glomerular bleeding are subjected to unnecessary urologic and radiologic investigations. And I'm, I'm really afraid that in the year 2020, I still have many patients who are unnecessarily subjected to a cystoscopy when in fact one good urinary sediment and one look under the face uh, contrast microscope 
would clarify this as glomerular bleeding. 1983, a landmark study of Reinhard Pabst and Bernd Sturzel from Germany and Yale uh, at that time did a study in rats and they have done a rot autoradiographic analysis. In those days, that was really uh, a, a very new technique. And what you can see here is this one cell, the really dark cell with the little grains surrounding it, that's a cell that took up radio-labeled thymidin. And what they have done then is they determined the daily glomerular cell turnover to be 1%. So 1% of all glomerular cells in the, rat, in the normal rat is replaced every day. And they specified that of these cells, 80% are glomerular endothelial cells. So these have a really high rapid turnover. 20% are mesangial cells. But the most important thing was that 0.0005% were podocytes. So Pabst and Sturzel were the first ones to recognize that podocytes are essentially terminally differentiated and don't proliferate. And this, of course, laid the ground for later analysis showing that podocytes, if at all, the, are the Achilles heel, so to speak, of the glomerulus because they have a big problem in being replaced. 1987, Charlie Alpers, Helmut Renke, James Hopper, and Claude uh, Biava described fibrillary glomerulonephritis, an entity with unusual immunofluorescence findings, seven patients with nephritic or nephrotic syndrome, but no known and detectable gammopathy, and the fibrils were kind of unusual. And of course, just very recently, uh, three years ago, we have learned that there is uh, DNA JB9 as one of the key antigens apparently localized in these fibrillary deposits, very distinct from amyloid that we know uh, from light chain amyloidosis. 1989, a very interesting experiment done by Yoshiyuki uh, Yoshida, Agnes Fogo, the current a uh, ISN president, and Aikuni Ishikawa. They, they did an interesting experiment. They took rats and did a two-third nephrectomy of one kidney. So the black is the nephrectomized kidney. And then they either left the other kidney intact or they took it out or and, and I think this is a very interesting experiment. They did a ureter diversion. So the kidney is still there, all the nephrons are still there, but the urine cannot be excreted. And they then looked at a uh, single nephron GFR, transcapillary hydraulic pressure, glomerular hypertrophy on day, day four, and glomerular sclerosis uh, after week four. So this is the baseline situation, and this is the comparator, two-thirds nephrectomy, one intact kidney left. If you then add a uninephrectomy to this, single nephron GFR goes up, pressure goes up in the capillary, hypertrophy develops very quickly, glomerular sclerosis develops within four weeks. But here's the interesting experiment. If you have a ureter diversion, GFR goes up, pressure goes up, no hypertrophy, and very little glomerulosclerosis after four weeks. So they conclude that physical loss of nephrons is required to trigger hypertrophy and sclerosis, and that glomerular hyperfunction alone does little to induce glomerular hypertrophy and sclerosis. So it is not the uremic mediators that cause all these changes. Next slide. Uh, the original paper was published in another, albeit uh, very well-known journal, uh, Claudio Ponticelli's famous randomized trial on methylprednisolone and chlorambucil in idiopathic membranous nephropathy. 
The follow-up study of that was of course published in Kidney International, the 10-year follow-up of these patients to really know what happened. And what Claudio Ponticelli and his colleagues published was that those patients who with membranous nephropathy who received chloampucil and methylprednisolone had a much better cause. They had a much more lasting full or partial remission of the nephrotic syndrome. Sorry, it must be off nephrotic syndrome, not all. And the cumulative probability of survival without dialysis was much, much lower. In fact, it was only 8% of going on to dialysis after 120 months, so after 10 years. Uh, so really an important long-term outcome, which very clearly established that immunosuppressive therapy can make sense in membranous nephropathy. So we now switch to 1999, a rapid communication by Larry Holzman and Dale Abrahamson. Nephrin localizes to the slit pore of the glomerular epithelial cell. Nephrin had just been identified as the cause of congenital nephrotic syndrome of the Finnish type. And what Larry Holzman and Dale Abrahamson did was to show that it's really only expressed in the kidney. Uh, if you look at the Western blot, it's nowhere else just kidney. If you produce a nephrin uh, antiserum, it's only labeled in the kidney and here only specifically in the glomeruli. And if you do immunogold labeling, you can localize all the little grains to the glomerular slit diaphragm. This was a landmark paper clearly showing that nephrin is a marker of the glomerular podocyte. 2001, two breakthrough papers uh, at the same time published in Kidney International uh, on IgA nephropathy. These are the two studies, one from the UK, John Feely's group and Alice Ellen, and one from Japan, uh, Yoshiyuki Hiki and Kenji Maeda's group, publishing that IgA in IgA nephropathy is under galactosylated and we feel nowadays that this is key in the pathogenesis. So what John Feely's group showed is that if you have serum and you do a lectin assay, those patients with IgA nephropathy have higher lectin binding, suggesting there's something wrong with the glycosylation pattern of this IgA. But then they had the unique situation that they had their hands on three kidneys from IgA patients, which were taken out after accidents because of tumors, and they could elute the glomerular IgA, and they could show that compared to the serum, the glomerular IgA was particularly undergalactosylated or underglycated, suggesting that it is this species of IgA which preferentially locates to the glomeruli. At the same time, by mass spectroscopy, which in those days was really a challenge to do. Uh, this Japanese consortium also uh, proved that dimeric IgA was galactose deficient and that this was really in the hinge region of the IgA molecule. Finally, to finish off a relatively recent landmark paper, the Oxford classification of IgA nephropathy. This was a landmark study because of the approach. So this was the first pathological classification scheme in glomerular diseases, which wasn't eminence-based, but here the authors took a worldwide approach, um, incredible worldwide approach to share slides and to look at which features would predict uh, progression or bad prognosis of IgA nephropathy. And they, of course, identified four key features, the T score, tubular interstitial atrophy and uh, fibrosis, the S score, glomerular sclerosis, and two more acute inflammatory lesions, 
the M and E, mesangial and endocapillary hypercellularity. And very recently, this MEST score has been supplemented with a fifth criterion, which is crescents, uh, not really shown here, but that's now the fifth prognostically important criterion. And whenever you do a kidney biopsy and discover IgA nephropathy, you should really ask your pathologist for the MEST C score as we know it nowadays. So in a nutshell, this was my choice of highlights from Kidney International from 1973 all the way down to 2009. And it's, I feel, very remarkable what has been published in Kidney International over all these years. And I'm very proud to be part of the editorial team of a journal where so many landmark studies have been published. Thank you very much to listen, for listening to me.